Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's live event, Resiliency and Clean Energy, Keeping the Lights On While Reducing Emissions. My name is Rebecca Lorenzen. I am the Policy Manager with CRESS, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum. CRESS Forum is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that educates the public and influences a national conversation around clean energy solutions that are actionable, market-friendly, and responsible. Charles Hernick, Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at CRIS Forum, will be our moderator today. Uh, just to give you a few brief housekeeping notes before we begin, as attendees, you will not appear on screen. However, we do encourage your participation. There is a Q&A box for attendees who would like to ask questions at the end of the discussion. It's on should be on the right hand side of your screen. If you have any technical difficulties, please message me through the chat. And we also encourage you to participate on social media. Our handle on Twitter is Crest Forum, and you can also use the hashtag clean energy. Without further ado, I will now give the floor to Charles. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks to folks for joining us here in the middle of August to talk about clean energy and resiliency. And I've got a great panel uh, with, and I'll read the names uh, real briefly uh, here, but also Commissioner Neil Chatterjee uh, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, has joined us and will provide some introductory remarks. And I'd like to get that, uh, get to that as quickly as possible. But Neil's remarks will be followed uh, by a panel that includes uh, Bryn Baker, Director of Policy Innovation with the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, REBA, Pat Wood, CEO of Hunt Energy Network and a for former FERC chairman. Jonathan Edelman, Vice President of Strategy and Planning with Excel Energy. And Ellen Swanson Katz, VP of Utilities for Tilson Technology Management. This is a very impressive group and we'll be able to dive in uh, to a, a deep conversation here, which really does matter because here uh, in the middle of August when it's the hottest, uh, and just in, in the brief conversation that we were able to have as uh, panelists before this, uh, talking about various uh, extreme weather events, which tend to make the news uh, because when extreme weather, whether it be a forest fire or uh, a hurricane or extreme heat or extreme cold, knocks out power, it knocks out one of the most fundamental uh, ingredients to our daily lives. And in this increasingly electrified uh, world, whether it be from transportation to what we're carrying around in our pockets uh, or wearing on our wrists, electricity matters, that reliability matters. Uh, keeping electricity cost effective matters for continuing to grow uh, our economy as we emerge from this pandemic. And there are a lot of different approaches to it. States have unique approaches. Uh, some states are participating in regional markets. Uh, some utilities are providing green tariffs. Others are competing against one another directly. So when we look across the country, there are a lot of different options and states are having uh, a lot of the same challenges in terms of dealing with resiliency as we transition to more and more clean energy. Uh, so this conversation is, is very timely. But first I wanna turn the floor uh, over to uh, Neil Chatterjee. Thank you, Neil, for joining us uh, today. If you could share some of your thoughts, uh, kind of top level in terms of where FERC has been, uh, look a little bit in the rearview mirror, look ahead a little bit. And as we talk about clean energy and more and more states are passing the 20%, 30% threshold for renewable power, folks are concerned about resiliency and folks are concerned about how they're gonna be able to keep the lights on in a cost-effective way. That's appropriate. Um, but there are a lot of technological solutions on the table and policy issues that have moved to the forefront. And thank you for your leadership to help navigate and address uh, some of those. So I'd like to turn it over to you. If you could uh, share some of your top level thoughts briefly on the subject, that'd be great for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for uh, for having me today uh, and to really engage on uh, a serious topic that has been at the core in some form or fashion uh, of all of the work that uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, has dealt with the past four years. Uh, I've had the honor of being both uh, chairman and commissioner during that time. And as I'm approaching the end of my tenure, uh, I'm particularly reflective about everything that uh, we have dealt with uh, and the challenges and, and, and opportunities and obstacles. And, you know, kind of my philosophy, the 
the core to my approach the past four years has been around markets and efficient market signals and uh, enabling the energy transition to take place to benefit consumers, the economy, and the environment through the strength uh, of the markets that the commission oversees. But I do also believe that the fundamental obligation and responsibility that my colleagues and I have is our oversight of the reliability of the grid to make sure that when it's this hot in August, the air comes on and the lights come on when Americans hit the switch. And as we see the benefits of this incredible energy transition, uh, we are also seeing new challenges emerge when it comes to reliability. And, and it's really been at the epicenter of the commission's work, as I said. Now it started uh, a bit flat footed and I'll be the first to acknowledge that. Uh, when I came to the commission in the uh, fall of 2017, I was actually sworn in uh, about four years ago this week uh, and I was temporarily serving as chairman. And then Energy Secretary Rick Perry submitted a notice of proposed rulemaking to the commission uh, using its authority to basically have the commission consider compensating uh, certain generation sources, namely baseload power, uh, for having the attribute of on-site fuel. And ultimately, the commission voted unanimously to reject that uh, notice of proposed rulemaking as not being legally viable. But I was serving temporarily as chairman. And as I reflect on my time here, I really bungled it. I didn't bungle it so much in my vote as I voted the right way, but it's the manner in which I handled it. I was still making the transition from partisan legislative aid to independent regulator. And I really approached that process the way a politician would or a political operative would, not an independent regulator. And in doing so, I fear that I injected an element of politics, which has made it difficult to consider what is a real issue. And it, it really came home to roost this past year where we had two states, two totally different grids, you know, California, a progressive state promoting, you know, uh, aggressive clean energy policies, Texas, a conservative state, both of their grids were severely tested due to, in one instance, wildfires and extreme heat. In the under, other instance, a, a unexpectedly uh, 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 strong and lengthy uh, cold spell. And, and what we saw there were there were challenges within market designs and different issues that genuinely require examination. I was frustrated in both cases because partially due to my own guilt of introducing politics into this serious conversation, everyone immediately viewed the circumstances through their own partisan fuel source lens. So in both instances, if you were opposed to renewable power, you're saying that, well, the windmills in Texas froze up or solar didn't show up. If you're opposed to fossil generation, it's, well, the wellheads froze uh, on pipelines and the coal piles froze. And there was even a nuclear plant that tripped off for safety reasons. Um, and uh, if you're for markets, you're saying, well, you know, Texas doesn't have a capacity market and now is the time for Texas to explore a capacity markets. If you're for interconnecting the grid, uh, you're saying, well, Texas is, you know, independent and had they been interconnected, they may have been able to avoid some of this. Well, in California, they are interconnected and yet, you know, their neighbors weren't able to provide the surplus power that was necessary, the balancing resources, the resource adequacy. This is my long-winded senatorial way of saying these are serious issues <laughs> that did, that demand a uh, serious evaluation. I think the commission has done a good job over the past four years in taking steps to address some of these. I think in one instance, we've removed barriers to entry to new technologies like battery storage and aggregated distributed energy resources. And as those technologies and their deployment accelerates uh, and they're more incorporated into our markets, perhaps we'll be better situated to handle some of these situations in the future. Uh, we've also uh, uh, done a lot in terms of, of the requisite energy infrastructure, whether it's getting uh, pipelines certificated where they're needed, uh, trying to uh, uh, establish clarity and certainty on our ROE policy uh, and incentives policy when it comes to transmission, uh, dealing with some of, and it was thorny, uh, I'm not going to lie, it was thorny, dealing with some of the issues where state policies and market fundamentals kind of came into collision. Uh, these are all things that the commission has wrestled with uh, over the past four years. I think 
we've 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 done a decent job, but you know there will always need to be iterative changes and improvements, and we could always do better. Uh, I applaud Chairman Glick and my colleagues um, for taking the bold step, particularly on transmission. Uh, my colleagues all voted last month uh, to open a process with an ANOPER on transmission, and I think uh, for me that is where the commission uh, should put the bulk of its focus the coming years around this question of resilience. We need to yep. have the infrastructure in place to ensure that the grid of the future is there. And that is a grid that will need to be a reliable grid and a resilient grid in the face of some of these extreme weather events. And so right. I think coupled with the actions we've taken in years past, looking ahead to the future with a focus on transmission, <laughs> uh, the commission uh, is opening a technical conference and dockets, examining markets, uh, which I uh, am supportive of, working on this transmission, ANOPER, and they also uh, have opened a docket to look specifically at resilience. We struggled during my tenure uh, to, to address the issue, to, to even define what resilience is. We couldn't even agree on how to pronounce right. it. Some people called it resiliency, <laughs> some people called it resilience. And again, uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that when I depart the commission uh, and some of the politics that I unfortunately and unintentionally overlaid into this, I'm hoping that with my departure, my colleagues will be able to do the serious work on the new docket that was opened in this regard, because it's very important work to do. And this, the, the situations we saw in California and, and Texas show that uh, these are yeah. real issues that need to be examined. And I look forward to the discussion today uh, and hearing from experts and their perspective on, on, on how we can uh, deal with these challenges. Well, thanks, Neil. And those are uh, very honest and, and humble comments that you just shared with us. So uh, thank you for that. You did mention infrastructure and the need for building the infrastructure of the future. And I'd be remiss to not mention or ask you and your thoughts, uh, brief thoughts, although there's nothing brief in this trillion dollar uh, infrastructure package. Uh, but if you could just share, what are some of the items in that bill that you've been tracking that will make a difference from a clean energy and resilience standpoint? Yeah, I'm excited about some of the grid investments. Uh, I, I need a little bit to learn a little bit more about how this new grid authority will function and how that will overlay with FERC. Uh, and then uh, I, I'm waiting for staff analysis, uh, should this ultimately make it to the president's desk and become law on, on uh, the siding authority uh, language that was included in the bill. Um, and so uh, again, it's uh, they just uh, uh, ultimately passed it uh, yesterday and then uh, passed the uh, budget resolution uh, at 4 a.m. this morning. So there's a lot to process yep. there. But uh, I was just encouraged that there were 69 votes for it in the Senate. Uh, it was a bipartisan bill. To yep. me, all of these issues should be above politics and, and all Americans should be focused on them. And so I was very encouraged uh, by the result. I'm hopeful that the House will will take it up in short order and pass it. And I do think there were certainly some, some meaningful and positive steps forward and really much needed uh, infrastructure investment in that package. $550 billion above the baseline is a big deal. Uh, I worked on the last bipartisan infrastructure package, Senator McConnell and Senator Boxer and Senator Inhofe in 2015. So I know how hard it is to put these packages together and pay for them. So I really commend uh, Senator Cinema and Portman in particular for their tremendous effort in this regard. Well, thanks for those thoughts, Neil. We're going to shift over to the panel now, but I appreciate your time uh, and your insights both on the, both on the infrastructure package and, and where FERC has, has been and, and where things are going. Uh, you're welcome to stick around and, and listen to the uh, presentations uh, and discussion here, but if you've got to jump off, that's totally understood, uh, but thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to shift over now to our panel conversation. And as I mentioned before, we've got four excellent panelists speaking uh, and, and coming from very different perspectives, champions of uh, competitive markets, champions of, um, of uh, you know, different types of, of markets that will help assure that customers are getting the type of renewable power, clean power, or reliable power that they're interested in. Um, so what I'd like to just do is a round robin where we can, um, I think, carry forward the the tenor that uh, that um, Commissioner Chatterjee brought forward. Instead of focusing on the things that divide us, like really focusing on um, you know where things can go, uh, whether their states are, are are have a vertically integrated model or whether states have a competitive model or are participating uh, in an RTO, to talk about 
you know, what are the pressing policy and technological challenges for grid modernization and this transition to clean energy? That's really our, our top level question here. Bryn, I'd like to start with you. Um, if you could introduce yourself, um, and I will maybe before saying that, um, we will paste the bios for everyone here in the chat. I don't want to read through. We've got a limited amount of time here, so I don't want to read through the bios, but they will be available for our audience in the chat. Please do take a look at them. We've got very distinguished panelists here. Uh, but Brent, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about um, your work with Reba and what the landscape looks like right now for corporate actors who are really leading the way in, in purchasing uh, renewable power. Sure, and and thank you, Charles. It's it's great to be with everyone today, and and a very esteemed panel. Thanks to Commissioner Chatterjee also for those um, solid and and reflective remarks. And I think uh, I'm Reba's policy director for uh, policy innovation. And thinking about this question of resiliency, I think I'd start where you, where you start started, Charles, which is where we're where we are today and what we're looking at it's it's hard to understate how the predictable unpredictability of climate change is really playing out now not in ipcc reports but via ice storms and fires and floods and hurricanes and it is disrupting the power system today and you add to that a, a changing resource mix with more and more renewable energy coming onto the system, driven both by policy and by increasing customer demand for clean energy. And you've got a whole lot of dynamic change happening within a fairly static power system that isn't always best at responding to change. And so we need to be preparing and building a power system that is dynamic, flexible, adaptive to these changing conditions and so the question in front of us is, how are we going to do that? And, and from our vantage point, how do we ensure that we are building a resilient customer centric zero carbon power grid equitably, cost efficiently, fast? Uh, and so why does Reba exist? We're a community of 250 large energy buyers and others uh, representing about six trillion in U.S. revenues and around 13 million employees uh, nationwide that really came together around a common vision for a resilient zero carbon grid where every organization has access to cost effective renewable energy. And increasingly that's shifting to a much broader aperture of zero carbon energy. Uh, we work with the largest energy buyers in the country, from the single largest energy buyer, the Department of Defense, to mining companies like Freeport McMoran, uh, to household brands like Johnson Johnson, and Disney, and Google, and Walmart, General Motors, and many smaller buyers as well. And these energy buyers, driven by ambitious clean energy goals of their own, have now contracted for over 35 gigawatts of new wind and solar nationwide in recent years, and that is really driving a significant amount of change. And now that they're invested in this transition to clean power, customers care a lot about this question of how are we going to design power markets to meet the curveballs that climate change is going to throw at us while not just protecting, but, but empowering customers and facilitating this absolutely massive trans transition of the, the most complex machine we've ever built into a decarbonized system that, as you said, keeps the lights on affordably for everyone. And so to this question of, of what are we working on on behalf of large energy buyers and trying to, to focus on to tackle this challenge, there's really two primary priorities uh, aimed at, at underpinning customers ability to, to choose and to drive clean energy, as well as decarbonizing the grid for, for all customers. And, and the first one is markets. So we share that alignment, um, whether it's bottom up or top down approaches to, to decarbonization, markets should underpin it. We think there should ultimately be an organized wholesale market or RTO uh, in every region of the country to give customers the transparency, the reliability and, and a least cost transition to zero carbon energy sources. And then secondly, around transmission, um, we are calling for a transmission macro grid to accommodate all of that zero carbon energy and to reduce cost to customers by bringing that least cost clean energy to load. So we know that in addition to 
clean energy integration and electrification benefits, a, a macro grid that's really connecting the nation's power grids together via a transmission system would, would help improve resilience to extreme weather by balancing and sharing resources across a wider geographic region. Uh, and that's even more efficiently facilitate, done when facilitated by RTOs. But we also know that transmission creates two to three times the customer benefits to costs and building out that needed transmission brings job creation potential as well. So right. we're really looking at those two areas as, as critical to providing this backbone um, to innovation and, and the fastest, most affordable transition to, to zero carbon energy. Thanks, Bryn. That's very uh, helpful background and context and very ambitious goals uh, for, for REBA to have. And I think um, gives us a lot of, of fuel for the conversation uh, looking ahead here. Pat, I do want to transition you know, over to you, and um, I'm hoping that you could talk a little bit about Hunt Energy Network. I recently read an article about you know, 500 megawatt distribution level batteries uh, in the Texas ERCOT market. I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about what's going on at Hunt Energy Network, but I also know that you know, back in June, you signed a, a, a letter with some of the some uh, other FERC former chairs that um, were th that really did call on one of the things that that Brent had mentioned in terms of establishing more and providing more market access um, across the country. I'm hoping you could talk a, a little bit about that too. Um, and as you answer this question about what are the pressing policy and, and technology challenges that we're facing and, and what we need to do to solve them. Well, thanks, Charles, and thank you all. I, I just want to associate myself with Bryn's comments really on those two key issues. I mean, organized markets, the commissioners did weigh in, Charles, as you've said, with our successor colleagues on the on the FERC to say, finish the job. Um, we got two thirds of the way done, but the non-California West and the, the far, the deep Southeast really could benefit and their customers could benefit most importantly from uh, competitive market. So we, we've um, been visiting with individual commissioners, which is a lovely reaction rather than just put the letter in the file and we'll see where that goes. But just to let them know, you know, from the old fraternity, we're, we got your back. These aren't easy to do. States sometimes <laughs> are going in different directions, but we, you know, we just want to give you solidarity that uh, bipartisan solidarity that this is important to the country. It's worked well. Um, and, and we want it to, you know, we think you never quite leave these jobs. I mean, I was Public Utility Commission of Texas chairman from 95 to 01 before I went on to FERC with President Bush. And um, in setting up that market, you know, clearly the events of February this year really, you know, were something that I wore in a very personal way because I thought, God, what could I have done if I were there? I could have, you know, overseen critical load uh, registries better and gotten the utilities to do more drills on rolling outages. But, you know, when I left the PUC, we had a 35 percent overbuild because all the exuberant new gas and new wind was zooming into the state. And yeah. so, you know, you know, you sit there and go, what it could have, should have. But anyway, today I'm I'm looking ahead because I see that the uh, resiliency of the grid can come from a number of different ways. I've been a big grid guy up to now, but today I stand on top of a substation and instead of looking toward the ERCOT headquarters in the middle of the state, I look to the edge of the grid. And so that's where we at Hunt Energy Network are you're staking our little claims with, um, you know, 10 megawatt batteries at substations across the state. And looking back toward the meter, because I think one of the things as we decarbonize and we decentralize, I got this from somebody else that just works so well. We've also got to democratize. Um, I'm a prosumer at this house. Um, the, the power behind me is being generated by solar panels. And when there are clouds, <clears throat> I've got a power wall in the garage that's keeping it on. There aren't a whole lot of me's around doing that. But just like everything else, that that adoption curve is really going to go up, particularly after the freeze in Texas. A lot of people do want to have some ability, but I, that's where we're looking. That's where a, a form of resiliency that we haven't tapped into hardly at all can come from, can come from the small generation, the storage and the smart appliance infrastructure and demand response that's not even barely tapped yet. So. That's yeah. where I'll be probably for the rest of my career and where you'll see me. But in not when I look back, just to close my thoughts on this, and, and I should give Neil credit. He didn't take it, and you should have, Neil, but 
Order 2222 was one passed by FERC under his leadership that did uh, really kind of change the debate about, and it's tough for the federal regulator to talk to something that really is so distribution oriented, but it was important that we talk about the role that this can play in the macro market, not just locally. Um, but in those macro markets, I, it, I sat here in the dark for 30, on my 36th hour back on February the 15th, 16th, and I thought about resiliency of the grid. And, you know, I was one of those uh, greenish Republicans that always cheered when the market shut down a dirty old plant. And, you know, some of those dirty old plants, I wouldn't have mind having around on February the 16th, getting those lights. <laughs> we ended up cutting back a lot of a lot of load and people sure. died and it was a tough deal. But um, when I look to the market of the future, we're just going to get more and more renewable energy. Um, I think, uh, Rebecca, if you could throw that little slide up, did it come through? Um, as we as we look at uh, the grids across the country, the ERCOT grid has kind of gone from zero to, you know, looks like second or third place in yeah. just 20 years. And when I think about renewable energy and resiliency in the context of our lights being out for, you know, a lot of the, a lot of a better, better part of a week, um, it was uh, bracing. So we're going to have to figure out a way to win both battles, to keep the lights on, but also to keep it affordable, well, three battles, keep it affordable and clean. And so the clean's coming. It's got the best economics. It's coming across the grid faster than I can even blink. We're building a lot more wind and solar than we're building anything else. And so yeah. Texas is going to be like California, kind of at the vanguard in trying to figure that out. So I've gotten to the point where probably 15 years from now, 80% of the hours of the year, the energy market's going to pay zero. Yep. So the other 20 percent of the hours of the year, we've got to have the money come in to support solar, wind, gas, coal that's cleaned up and batteries in a way that makes economic sense. If we're going to use the market construct that we have uh, had such success with so far. So that's where the debate in Texas is and where I think the debate nationally ought to focus on is in market design. How do we make sure that we've got the price signals that you know continue to push innovation? support affordability for customers, not just the big bank checks that, you know, some of the fully regulated environments are kind of used, getting used to coming back. And and how do we do that in a way that uh, makes the lights stay on? Yeah. Um, resiliency is um, my new middle name. I, uh, I kind of rolled <laughs> my eyes when, 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 you know, when Governor Perry sent that missive to, Gov to Chairman Chatterjee and his colleagues five years ago, you know, the uh, the FERC commissioners, that was our first effort to kind of come together and, and fight was that's just that that would have done such damage to the markets. But, you know, damn it, looking back, I wish, you know, as Neil just admitted and I, I'm with him nodding, it's uh, I wish we'd have been able to pivot that to a really thoughtful view of forward looking resiliency market incentives, because that's right. the answer. How do we keep all this on? How do we clean up what's dirty? but keep using it when we need to, like New England burns fuel oil in the middle of the winter, um, but it's pretty green the rest of the year. Everybody's okay with that because they want yeah. to keep the lights on. So it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough debate. I think uh, I want to be part of the solution. I'm not under any pretense batteries solve everything, but um, I look forward to, to bringing that part of the, the edge uh, to solving the problem. Thanks, Pat, for those comments. And I, apparently, we didn't get the the image that you were trying to send on on the back end here. Um, if we get that later, we'll we'll try to pop that up. But I think that your your comments are really important. I started the conversation talking about economic growth and and resiliency is important for just keeping the lights on. But um, you're right; it's not just about livelihoods; it's about lives uh, at a very fundamental level on on the extreme uh, hot and and cold days. So that building in resiliency really does matter. And I, I think you're fine as a greenish Republican. I, I'll, I'll consider myself a bright green Republican, you know, so uh, that's uh, to totally fine. Um, Jonathan, I want to kick it over to you. I think there's no, um, you know, looking at the global stage, there's no substitute for for global, for American leadership on the global stage when it comes to issues of climate uh, and clean energy. But, you know, here at home, there's also no substitute for corporate leadership when it comes to um, I think, well, I, uh, sending market signals uh, that uh, that um, Commissioner Chatterjee was talking about, that even Pat was talking about in terms of where corporations are going, how they're valuing not just the 
quantity uh, and price of electricity, but the quality too. Excel Energy stands um, really at the front of the pack, both in terms of when you all made your commitment to go uh, to, to zero emissions, a carbon free um, future by, by mid century. And I made the mistake of typing in net zero in, in an early description and you were quick to correct me. And I, and I think that that's um, ambitious um, and, and really puts uh, Excel at the front of the pack. But I do want to ask, um, and as it relates to this, what are some of the technological and policy challenges and changes that you all will need to help achieve uh, your ambitious goals? Yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, well, first off, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, you know, I'll kind of maybe bring a slightly different perspective being a, a utility uh, company uh, perspective here. So just quickly for myself, uh, you know, I, I really wear two hats of Excel Energy. I, I coordinate our uh, overall strategic planning function and I also run our generation planning group. So obviously the, the generation side of it is uh, very close to what I do and, and uh, very pertinent to what we've talked about today. Um, you know, Excel overall, just to orient folks, uh, you know, we're a, a Minneapolis based utility company. Uh, we operate in eight states uh, across uh, the Midwest part of the United States. Uh, we've got about 3.7 million electric and 2.1 million gas customers. Uh, we're fully uh, vertically integrated. Uh, we operate both in and out of markets. Uh, we're in MISO and SPP and also have service territories outside of markets. Um, and, and I'll just highlight that, you know, I, I know there have been discussions already on markets. We can talk about that more. Um, I would just highlight that we're driving forward our, our carbon strategy, uh, both within and, with, and, and outside of markets. And so I think it can happen. Um, so let me, you know, you talked about that carbon free vision. Obviously, that's something, uh, you know, really close to us and something that we're very proud of. Uh, in December of 2018, so we're a few years in now, uh, we announced our plans to uh, eliminate 80% of our carbon by 2030 and and had a vision to eliminate 100% of it by 2050. You know, obviously the transition here is immensely co complicated, um, but I like to kind of think about this in relatively simple terms. And I really kind of in my mind, I think about three phases, at least for our company in this transition. Um, the first was kind of an energy replacement approach where we are just basically weaving in and blending in um, both economic and policy driven uh, renewable adoption to uh, to support our system. Um, that first phase, I think we've transitioned past that. Uh, we, we made some, some significant gains predominantly in wind and, and, and really brought some additional renewables to our system in that phase. Uh, but really we, over the last uh, few years, we've, we've migrated into again, what I think of as phase two, which is migrating into kind of a capacity replacement approach. So it's not just blending in new renewables, we're really starting to get into replacing our existing dispatchable and fully dispatchable generation on our system. Um, obviously this step, and we're, we're midway through this, I'll talk more about it here in a minute. Um, obviously this step is, is where we start to get into all these reliability and res resiliency considerations. Um, a, a far more complicated transition, um, but I think one that we're managing very effectively today. Um, the third phase, which I see is next, and I appreciate you, you, you noting the, 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 that vision for 2050, uh, that full decarbonization phase obviously is, is the next piece to come. Um, that's going to bring a lot more uh, complexity to it um, that we'll have to manage. And I think that's frankly dependent on, on technologies that need to make additional uh, progress today. But so, so what led to this? Um, you know, in 2018, we'd already made a lot of progress in renewables. Um, we have some of the best renewable resources in the country, and uh, we're really bringing forward projects um, that were um, really actually blending down our customer costs. So when you can mm -hmm. make environmental gain and lower customer costs, I mean, it's a pretty good win for everybody. Um, we also have some great policy frameworks uh, at a state level that were supporting our transition. Um, and obviously there's federal policies around incentives for renewables. Um, you know, these things all kind of came together and we saw a number of pathways that we could take as a company to 2030 um, and achieve that 80% goal. Um, it was not based on any emergent technology. We saw we could do it with the existing technologies that were there, and we thought we could get there both um, cost effectively and reliably. 
Um, and I think that is, and I think, you know, Pat highlighted this earlier, and I think it's a really spot on comment. It's, you know, you gotta manage the carbon, you gotta manage the cost, and you gotta manage the reliability. Um, if you don't do all three of those things, I think you you, you run the risk of, of putting the brakes on or even reversing course. So uh, we wear all three of those uh, challenges. Um, you know, they're very tied into our strategy. So where are we now? Um, you know, through, I'll give you 2020 numbers here. Um, through the end of 2020, we've actually already eliminated uh, about 50% of the carbon uh, on our system. And currently we're getting about 50% of our energy from carbon free resources. Um, I would add or clarify that that does include, we have a few nuclear units on our system, yeah. uh, which we view as a critical aspect of this transition. Um, but our current system is about 35% of our energy is, is from renewable resources. Um, we also have filings in all of our major jurisdictions, basically seeking to get to our plan to 80 percent. Um, in fact, our, our two largest plans that we filed in Minnesota and Colorado actually are targeting almost an 85 percent reduction by 2030. Wow. Um, and that will be made up of about 60 percent renewables. So, you know, I would actually again in that phase two that I talked about, I think we're well on our way uh, to achieve that 80 80 percent goal as a company. Um, and again, I just really want to emphasize that that is that is, of course, driven by carbon, but is is the underpinnings of reliability and, and affordability are critical and um, as part of that transition. So um, I just you know, you asked about some of the challenges here and, and how this transition will go again. You know, the details really, really matter. Um, and, and, you know, I'll stay out of the weeds of the utility industry, but ensuring things that we get like reserve margins uh, set correctly, ensuring things that we get uh, the right accredited capacity for these resources is, is critical. Um, and of course, we need to maintain the dispatchability of our system to meet all these extreme events that, you know, we're seeing more and more of on the system. So I'll close with this, you know, you talk about that, that 2050 um, the vision. you know, obviously there's, there's still some challenges in getting there. Um, I think, you know, the critical aspects of that are, are having um, or seeing advancements in carbon free dispatchable gen. Um, that's going to be critical. Um, I think, you know, integrating renewables into the system is going to continue needing, you know, integration of dispatchable resources, gas or supplemental uh, or, or resources that can be dispatched that don't produce carbon. Um, I do see nuclear as a critical component of the equation. I think yep. continued build out of transmission is going to be critically important as we look at this as a, as a national issue, as are other things like uh, energy efficiency and other customer facing programs. So a lot more to come there, but um, you know, I think that when we set this goal in, in, in 2018, um, I think that we felt confident and if anything, based on, on what we've done so far and where we see things going, I feel more confident today about achieving both the, the 80 percent objectives as well as ultimately that fully decarbonization uh, plan by 2050. So uh, yeah, appreciate it and happy to talk about all that stuff more. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I, I do value your focus on while well, talking about the tangible investments that Excel has made to to improve environmental outcomes and reduce costs, and that both can be done uh, at the at the same time, that's a, a really big uh, deal, and I think an important part of um, the clean energy story over the course of the past five and, and even ten years, uh, and what you all are doing both within and outside of markets to to deliver that change. Uh, you brought up nuclear power. I'm glad you did. It's not without controversy. Crest believes that uh, you know nuclear power is a vital vital ingredient um, in the in the clean energy future. Uh, but there are challenges there too. And I know that it's um, well maybe of some controversy in in the infrastructure package that there are tax credits to help uh, uh, keep keep nuclear power plants uh, online. And maybe that's something that we can uh, revisit later and talk a little bit more about nuclear power. But Ellen, I want to get over to you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and, and I hope that you can talk a little bit about Tilson, what you all do. Very cool company that is at that frontier of technology um, and, and clean energy. Um, but I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about your role at Tilson, what the company does, um, but also getting back to this issue of, of both the technology and policy elements um, that you're monitoring and that we need to see changes on to achieve this uh, clean energy future and resilient um, grid that we know we need. 
Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and the Crest members and um, the audience. And actually, thank everyone on the on the panel, because I feel like everyone is working really hard towards an important goal. Um, we may view things differently, but um, I think the common goal is what drives us all here. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about Tilson. Tilson is a company that's on a mission to build America's information infrastructure. I'm vice president of utilities and I work with utilities on developing their um, communication networks that they need to run their own systems. Uh, and as I'm sure many people know, um, clean energy is dependent on connectivity. Grid modernization is dependent on connectivity because we now have this interactive grid and it's incredibly important that to utilities that they have um, visibility into the grid through broadband connectivity, ideally to the all the way to the grid edge and the consumer as you're trying to integrate consumer renewables like rooftop solars and battery storage. Um, ultimately, as you gain scale, utilities need the ability to see and hopefully have some um, interaction with consumer renewables, whether it's from the, um, the large commercial clients that Bryn represents and all the way to, um, you know, people putting on rooftop solar or installing power walls. Uh, that's going to allow us to maximize the value of that, that, that resource that we're all investing in. Um, and so I work with utilities to build those communication networks. Um, I also work with them on something that's personal passion of mine, which is closing the digital divide and leveraging that infrastructure to also be able to support um, deployment to unserved consumers. Uh, I, I will tell you that my, I come to this position with a background. I was the consumer advocate for the state of Connecticut for eight years, as well as the president of the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates, NASUCA. Um, Pat, I will associate myself with your remark that you never really leave these jobs. Um, once a consumer advocate, always a consumer advocate. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm always looking at um, what we do, what utilities do, what this industry is doing through, how does this ultimately um, impact serve the consumer? Um, and I would uh, respectfully um, make a slight amendment to the title of this panel. I would call it resiliency, clean energy, and affordability, keeping the lights on. Um, yeah. Because affordability is incredibly important, um, both to, uh, there's um, energy, Poverty is a real problem in this country. People who struggle to pay their energy bills. I'm from New England. I have the, case, the state that unfortunately boasts the highest electric rates in the continental U.S. Um, and so it's something yeah. that's always been, always been on my mind. And the reasons for that. What was that? Oh, keep going. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so. I, I think when we talk about, um, we're talking about resiliency and storms, that too has a cost to consumers. Uh, you know, we had a bill in Connecticut helping consumers pay for um, lost groceries because of a, a sustained outage. You know, it, it impacts us at so many levels when we have these, these substantial outages. At the same time, we want to make sure that our investments are cost effective. Um, Bryn, you said something about equity, and I couldn't agree more. I think one of the reasons I'm so passionate about um, providing connectivity to utilities throughout their system down to the consumer level. And so I think it's incredibly important to ensure energy equity, to ensure that um, every consumer has access to these programs that um, so many utilities like Excel are investing in, be it um, the power walls, uh, dynamic charging for electric vehicles, um, even into, you know, we talk a lot about in the urban space about electric buses and electric transportation to address some of the um, environmental justice impacts. And so I think um, it's, it's incredibly important to have these conversations and think about how we're ensuring that we are bringing energy affordability throughout the system. Um, I will push back, and no one here has made that assumption, but I will push back against the assumption that you can have affordability or you can have clean energy, but you can't have both. Um, I, that is uh, increasingly not true. We are seeing when you buy yeah renewables at scale, you are getting two, three cents kilowatt hour, um, even in expensive New England. So I'm a big right. proponent for investing in, um, in in models that allow us to get the most for every consumer benefit. And um, I will say, I know this is not a markets panel, um, but markets has been mentioned uh, and 
Pat, you and I seem to frequently find ourselves at both ends of the spectrum. As a consumer advocate, I have very concerned about the impacts of uh, deregulation on residential consumers. And I would just point out that, you know, the Wall Street Journal, which is not exactly, uh, you know, which is a, a real proponent of free markets, has uh, done a recent study showing the negative impact on residential consumers um, of deregulation and electric suppliers. So um, look forward to the conversation ahead. Yeah, thanks, Ellen, and um, appreciate uh, your comment on affordability. Happy to make that a friendly amendment to change <laughs> the uh, to change the the title here and and add that in. Um, I do want to remind our attendees that you can drop any questions that you have into the chat. We've got a couple, and I'll actually start with with these two. And I've got a couple of other questions that I that I do want to ask, but um, I do want to invite audience participation. So please don't hesitate uh, to drop something in uh, to the chat here. Um, and this is one that I actually don't know too much about. I'll ask both questions and then we can, if, if folks want to jump in, uh, that'll be good. But um, one of the questions focuses on the uh, interconnection to Canada and Mexico under the NERC mandate. How does uh, the resiliency and rapid response to outages continue um, in, along this North American corridor? Uh, so that's maybe one, one question. Uh, and then the other question is looking at uh, resiliency needing to consider long duration like seasonal storage and other non-battery solutions. Um, there's a the, the question here goes then on to, to obsession with uh, lithium ion batteries, um, but I wonder if we could speak a little bit more about that. Like what are some of the different um, long term seasonal storage options that that might exist? So I'm not sure if anyone wants to jump in on one or both of those questions, but I'll pause just for a minute here. I'll just speak to the intercontinental one. Um, certainly, you know, you think of Canada, New England, Hydro Quebec kind of being a good example, or Hydro Quebec fitting into to, to New York model. I mean, I've dealt with those. You know, I also dealt with the outage that happened in 2003, where Ohio knocked out Ontario for up to a week. So um, during our freeze, um, we were, uh, Mexico helped a lot uh, right before. The lights went out, but then it got so cold across the, I mean, we had the first snow in Brownsville, Texas since the 1890s. So that cold didn't stop at the Rio Grande. It went into Mexico and then they pulled all their power back. I mean, that's happening in California too. It's like, hey, it's hot as hell here too, not just in California. We need the power where we, <laughs> we're, we're generating it. So that those, those helping hands work for a while, but if, you know, if the catastrophe or the weather or whatever it is, is across a broad area, then it is hard to say my needs are more important than yours. So good, friendly sure. neighbors, great idea, but you need a different dimension on resiliency, which I like about this one, which you mentioned. I mean, hydro is probably the best example of the long term storage. BPA wrote the book on that and their their uh, relationship with the California market is, I think, something we're all familiar with, where the excess goes to California at the time when they need it. Of course, you've got to have hydro, which in the power crisis of 99-2000 and a little bit last year, you had when the hydro didn't show up and snow snowpack didn't really come because the winter was so mild that that has a kind of a long perpetual, a, a long tail that affects mm -hmm. you next year. So, um, long, long, long duration storage from a chemical point of view. You know, obviously, I'm looking at very short duration issues, and with the lithium ion that was mentioned here, I'm I'm technology agnostic and would certainly look forward to to cost effective technologies. But uh, they aren't here yet. Um, I would say the next ten years, you're going to have the same jump start that we saw with wind 20 years ago, solar 10 years ago, storage in general in the last five years. The long-term right. storage is the next one on stage. Yeah. I would just I would just add, Charles. Oh, I'm sorry. That um, I think we need a better paradigm for getting transmission for renewables um, to to where we need it most. Um, and I'll just give the example of New England. Um, for the last decade, long or longer, um, New England, particularly southern New England, has been trying to get access to Hydro Quebec's renewable power for reasons of cost, for reasons of clean energy. Um, and first tried through New Hampshire, then through Maine, and now there's an effort to bring it in through Vermont. Uh, and these kinds of barriers are incredibly difficult. And despite the greatest political will, um, it seems like 
we just keep creating barriers to um, accessing right. uh, this kind of renewable energy that may be more cost effective. Um, so I think that's an issue that we need to continue to work on. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in real quick, just utility perspective on storage. Um, I, I don't think there's any obsession from an industry perspective with lithium ion. I think that our obsession is on carbon reduction, reliability, and low cost. And, um, you know, lithium ion has been the winner there. I mean, there's some ITC variables that come into play as well. But, um, you know, we run competitive solicitations, and those are the technologies that, that win. Um, mm -hmm. I think Pat's comment is just spot on. Um, I think that these longer duration storage devices will become more important going forward, but the price just isn't quite there yet. So I think, you know, again, investing in technology development, both at a, a federal level as, and a state level for some of these longer duration type, type techs um, will be critical long term for the transition. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I want to ask um, kind of a, a maybe a follow up question and, and Brent, I want to get your thoughts on uh, this first. Um, but one of the things that is impressive to me looking at the data, um, corporate power purchase agreements, corporate level interest um, uh, in representing, and, and some of it are, are the companies that are participating in, in REBA. Um, looking at Business Council for Sustainable Energy data, it, it's responsible for something like half of driving all uh, new renewable investment. And that's just astonishing. It's like an astonishing figure uh, to me. Um, and so these companies are obviously competing against each other to uh, make this drive to to reduce emissions uh, not not far and probably uh, factors into what Excel you know energy is doing. Um, and and I just want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, competition is something that is big. The, the, the president recently put out an executive order promoting uh, competition in the American economy. It targeted healthcare and and technology for all the reasons that that we know about in in the news. But I just wonder, what are some of the lessons that are transferable to the energy sector, whether it be uh, the competitive solicitations that Excel is, is undertaking or the types of projects that Tilson is doing or Bryn, the, the type of uh, competition that you're seeing for, I don't know if there are new types of power purchase agreements that are coming into vogue now or if there are um, new reasons that companies are, are looking to make these types of, of long term commitments. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit about how folks are trying to differentiate themselves in the clean energy space uh, and how that's factoring into this resiliency conversation. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it is actually pretty astonishing that even despite the, the the last 16 months, corporate purchasing continued to accelerate. It didn't even slow down at all. I mean, last year was a was a record year of over 10 gigawatts of new renewables contracted. So. So not only is it accelerating, but yeah, the contract types and the approaches are definitely evolving. When all of this started nearly 10 years ago, everybody was was trying to figure out how to execute thousand plus page contracts that took multiple years to execute. And that's now, you know, much more streamlined. It takes a couple of months. And so you now have over 120 individual large energy buyers who have signed these these off-site large-scale power purchase agreements and lots and lots of smaller buyers are trying to figure out how to do you know smaller types of contracts so this is absolutely driving the market i guess there's two observations though kind of about the future of all of this which is one you know where these customers operate which is everywhere in the country they have found that they have more optionality and the ability to drive more clean energy at scale faster where there is a wholesale electricity market. So a little bit back to the earlier point, this isn't a markets panel, but I think where the customers who are buying clean energy have come together is, is not around restructuring, but around wholesale markets because it allows transparency, it facilitates reliability, but also facilitates options. And so that's been really critical to enabling so much of what voluntary buyers have been able to do to date. But I think the second thing that's that's evolving is the fact that customers are now not setting 100% renewable energy goals. They're setting round the clock 24-7 clean energy procurement goals. And that is a whole new ball game when it comes to trying to figure out how to power your operations, not by matching racks on an annual basis, but by cons getting contracts that are not delivering precise electrons, but are matching your load where you consume it with clean energy around the clock. Mm -hmm. And 
that's kind of where all this is headed. And once again, I think it's it's wholesale markets that provide the kinds of optionality for that, in addition to doing other things that are going to make sure that we're, you know, greening the grid everywhere, we're building the amount of transmission we need. Because I think what ultimately those kinds of approaches of we're now, we as corporates are now thinking about this is how the grid operates. It's not yeah. about annual matching. It's about round the clock clean energy, but that means you've got to green the grid for everybody. Thanks, Bryn. Anybody else want to jump? Jump in on that or here's one question from the audience that I don't know the answer to, but which of the RTOs that exist today is closest to the principles expressed in FERC Order 2000? I don't know who can answer that question. <laughs> I Give that one to Pat. <laughs> that's a that's a me question. Um <laughs> You know, key issues of 2000 were, you know, real time market independence, good governance that had independence. I think that's probably the issue there. Um, yeah. Uh, that might distinguish some. I think uh, because of the way, and this is, I was asked this question after the, uh, at the Senate Energy Committee by Senator Manchin when I was up there testifying after the Texas events. Uh, they couldn't get the ERCOT CEO, so I volunteered as the B team. But uh, he asked the question, well, what's what's so bad about Texas going under FERC jurisdiction? I said, I wouldn't have the, I would lose the ability to have the, the hammer to form competitive market that we had in Texas. Our utilities didn't have the option to say no. We put them in a, uh, the ERCOT ISO in 95, right when I got there and said, let's get going on wholesale markets. So that ability at FERC uh, of the of the utilities to come in and come out of the at the of the RT, of the RTOs and really form them because they are the yeah. transmission yeah. owners after all that's a big difference and so I do worry about the independence of RTOs um, I don't stay up at night worrying about it we had a stakeholder driven RTO board here in Texas until February when the legislature said we're going the full independent route like all the FERC RTOs but um, you know I, I would say. Clearly, the seven all, I, I don't think capacity markets are a necessary requirement. Um, in fact, when I was at FERC, I didn't push that. We FERC could not actually order capacity markets anyway, even if we liked them. They were brought to us by stakeholders. So, but so all the, the markets vary on that important regard. But with regard to the fundamental, you know, economic dispatch, security constrained model, they're all comparable. I mean, I'm, by all, I mean MISO. PJM, New York, New England, ERCOT, um, Cal ISO, um, Alberta uh, to large regard. Uh, uh, Ontario is a little different, um, but fundamentally all about the same. And um, so I think I think on governance, perhaps uh, <laughs> uh, oddly enough, ERCOT may move from last place to first by having one. But you know, there's still some political involvement, much as there is with the California board. Uh, so people might factor that in differently, but uh, you know, I think order 2000, I didn't pass it. I just, my job was to implement it so I can judge it a little more critically. <laughs> uh, it was, it, it was, a, it was a great template. And uh, again, I think the rest of the nation doesn't need to be scared of that. I think it actually is very customer benefiting and in a general kind of way, moving things to a market uh, structure that's not disruptive. Well, thanks for that insight there, Pat. I do have an eye on the clock. I want to be respectful of uh, not just our panelist time here, but also attendees. There was one additional question that um, deserves a whole separate panel that focuses on addressing, uh, you know, protecting installations against natural disasters, floods, fires, and cyber attacks. That cyber conversation is a whole different uh, elephant that I hope we can tackle uh, at a different time and at a future date. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, all of you uh, panelists for joining us here today. Uh, taking a break uh, in October to to get into um, what is an important conversation on clean energy and uh, the ro role of, of policy and technology in um, assuring that we have uh, resiliency on the grid. So thanks everyone for your time and your participation. And I would invite you to register and keep an eye out for National Clean Energy Week. It's the last week in September. Um, Crest Forum uh, does a lot to help organize. Uh, and crowd in uh, good attendance and participation. All of the above clean energy uh, is favored at, at that conference. Uh, so please take a look at nationalcleanenergyweek.org and we'll catch you soon after that. Thanks all.
Thank you. Thank you.